Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Chief Technology Officer of Amazon.com, Dr. Werner Vogels. Good morning, Las Vegas. I can't give me some love back. Good morning, Las Vegas. Hey, there was some party last night, eh? That was excellent. And actually, I know you guys had a lot of fun, and there were lots of exciting things yesterday during the keynote, during the sessions, and our good friends of Animoto actually made a great video of this. So, watch this. Great, eh? So, um, so yesterday was a, I, I like to believe, a spectacular day. So great keynote by Andy Jassy. Um, it's a 25% off S3, you know, globally. It's a, a screamingly fast data warehouse, Amazon Redshift. I mean, all of these things, and, and that's just the start. That was just yesterday. I think there were many great sessions by many of our partners and customers that told their stories. So what do we have in stock for you today? Today is hopefully not that much different. Yeah. So in my keynote today, uh, I'm very fortunate to have a few customers that will tell their stories. Um, we'll have some live demos. We may even have some new things. Who knows? Um, but mostly, of course, today is that there's a whole range of new um, technical sessions going on that will hopefully educate you, help you build cloud, be help you build your cloud-aware applications and understand you, you know, where, where the real value of cloud is. And actually, if I go back to uh, 2007, yeah, I think probably 2007 was the first time that we uh, really started giving presentations about you know, what was the value of cloud. And, and I've, I've always defined uh, cloud computing by its benefits. Yeah, as, much as, as much as cool the technology is, um, the benefits were the ones that really drive this home. Yeah, and it's always been about cost, it's always been about uh, agility and about removing the heavy lifting. And I think Andy did a great job yesterday in his keynote for laying out those principles. And actually, I already had those principles on a slide in 2007. Yeah? As you can see, my, my slide making skills in those days were already wonderful. Yeah? And actually, there always was a fourth box on that slide. And that was, I have always thought that you know, the way that we were building these technologies, that we were building these services, would be the foundation for how the next generation of applications will be built. That's sort of the, the 2001, the 21st, 2001, the 21st century architectures. 
Yeah, and, and so actually being able to build architectures the way that you always wanted them to be built and that you could not be constrained by anything. And so wh wh why do we care actually about this 21st century architectures? Why do we want to build things differently? Because I like to believe in the old world, everything was constrained. You know, whether that is, whether it's your capital or whether it's capacity or whether it's geography, you know, if in the old world you needed to launch a service in Japan, I mean, you needed to do data center negotiations, there are multiple data center negotiations, and all of these things, all you're thinking, no matter how good an engineer you were, you were always constrained by the real resources, by the fact that resources were hardcore hardware resources. And, and actually, there's good examples. Uh, for example, in this case, from Amazon.com. Yeah, I'd like to believe that the Amazon.com engineers are some of the best scalability engineers in the world. Already in 2007, they knew exactly how to manage large-scale systems, the very fine-grained so service-oriented architecture. And actually, you know what? From, a, from, a, from an efficiency point of view, or from an architecture point of view, it didn't really matter that much because we were constrained by hardware. So this is a weekly, typical weekly pattern at, uh, at Amazon.com. And from a capacity planning point of view, you would take a rule of thumb and say, we need 15% over expected peak. Now at Amazon scale, you're really good at predicting peak. And so that would so be sort of the hardware that you would have in stock to support Amazon.com on, on a weekly basis. And if you look at this, the damning fact there is that actually about 39% of your capacity goes wasted because it's not being used. Yeah. And that is even just on a normal weekly basis. Let's take a look at, uh, at where we are now, November. Yeah, at the end of November, we have these days called uh, is it Black Friday and Cyber Monday, and peaks there are easily, easily three to four times the normal weekly peaks. And again, you take the same rule. Yeah, 15% over expected peak is the capacity that you need to have in stock. And that means that for the month of November, as a business, you would be losing about 75% of your capacity. Or you wouldn't really be losing, you would be having it unused. And for a retail business like Amazon.com, where, yeah, which has low margins, yeah, losing about 75% of your investment in infrastructure, not having used, is really bad for business. Yeah, and we've, we've actually had a really good business for a very long time, but it could be so much more efficient. And actually, there's something much more worse here. Because imagine, like in 2009, I believe it was, that we, uh, that we would run a promotion on Thanksgiving. Yeah, on Thanksgiving Day in I think 2009, 2010, 2009, I think, uh, we had a thousand Wii's for sale. They were scarce in those days. And so for some reason, we ran this promotion on Thanksgiving Day where we told everybody at 11 o'clock in the morning, you can go buy one of these thousand weeks. Now, okay, so we're stupid, yeah? It's not a physical store, it's a virtual store. At five minutes to 11, all your customers go like F5, 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 yeah? Can you imagine what happens to that peak? Yeah, that peak at, uh, at Black Friday is nothing compared to the peak that we experienced at 11 o'clock on Thanksgiving morning. And believe me, there were millions of people on the site that were going like, what is happening? And so being constrained by hardware actually makes it impossible to do the things that you want to do as a business. Now, there's two really great dates. Yeah, this is uh, November 10, 2010. That's when we turned off the last physical web server of Amazon.com. And October 31st, 2011 was when we turned off the last web servers in Dublin that were supporting uh, the European business. So how does the graph look now? This is how the graph looks for this year. Yeah, and there's many uh, great stories. If you went to Laura's grid uh, session yesterday on drinking your own champagne, as we call it, um, you heard how, for example, in those days, scaling was nonlinear and things like that. Now we can scale on a single server basis. Yeah, and that no matter what promotion we run, we're actually able to do it. We are no longer constrained at Amazon.com 
by resources. And so the new world for everyone is that you can build architectures that are unconstrained by resources. Yeah, except maybe for speed of light. Pretty sure that if you come back in three, five years, we may have a solution for that one as well. Not a promise though, yeah? So, um, so what I then call 21st century architectures are actually those architectures that you've always wanted to build. And actually, you already knew how you wanted to build them. Uh, take for example, fault tolerance, which is sort of my, my old stomping ground. 15 years ago, we already knew what the architectures were for building fault tolerance systems. The algorithms were already there. The knowledge was already there. Research had already finished. Uh, we just never did it. And wh why did we not do it? Because it was just too hard. Yeah? And it was only those actually that actually could gain scale that were able to actually implement fault tolerance systems. And so scale and fault tolerance were heavily linked. But today, you know, where everything is just a programmable unit, where you no longer have to do data descent negotiations, where I can launch a very small site that just has two servers in two availability zones, but is completely fault tolerant. Yeah? And that's actually sort of the, the major change that we see happening now. Yeah? And the big concept behind that is that everything now is a programmable resource. There are no physics anymore. Things that you needed to do by walking to the data center, by hugging your server, and believe me, I've hugged servers enough in my life, they do not hug you back. Yeah? They hate you, actually. I honestly believe that they hate you. Yeah? At least that's how they behave towards me. Um, but, you know, all of these things now are programmable reasons. If I want to launch a service tomorrow in Sydney, I can do that from my laptop here. There's data centers, there's networks, I can do VPC, I can control the network all over the world. It's all in your hands, it's on your fingertips. And I think this is the major difference between the old world. You know, the old world, everything was resource focused. Everything was fixed and rigid and top-down control. And why? Because everything was constrained. And the new way of thinking is actually where in the old world, you really focused on the resources that you had to acquire. Yeah? The new world is where you can actually build architectures that are purely focused on delivering value for your business. And I also like to believe that the way that we build software has changed dramatically. Yeah, and that the cloud actually is capable of powering the new way of software development. Oh, and and I, I would like to believe that it's not only the building of new sort of cool architectures, it's actually, I like to believe that when we build them, we are more successful in terms of building our projects. If you look back at some of the, uh, the studies that have been done, around failures of large-scale projects. Yeah? The numbers are still damningly bad. Yeah? Three, well over 30% of large-scale projects, resource-focused projects, do not even complete. Yeah? And half of them, if they do complete, they absolutely run over, over, over budget. And so what is the cause of that? If you look at those that did research in why do large-scale IT projects actually fail in the past, no, there was these, these four reasons for it. And I think the top two are really important. Yeah? It's very, very hard on forehand if you have a large scale project to run to actually estimate the resources that you need for it. But in this resource focused world, you need to estimate the resources up front. And so if you make a mistake, you're toast. And the second thing is then, you know, changing requirements. Now, I don't know how many of you are actually engineers or architects, you know. Customers, whether they're internal or external, always change the requirements on you. And don't you hate that? Yeah? Actually, you should not. Because I'd like to believe that's real life. You know? Priorities change during a, for, for your business. And so changing requirements is actually something that is absolutely totally normal for your customers to do or for the stakeholders to do. It's just the reason why we hate them is that it would actually mess up our resource-focused world. So I like to believe that in the new world, in this new world where you are no longer bogged down by resources, these, these numbers will change. It's likely, and I think we've seen already, 
uh, in a number of enterprises that have adopted sort of a cloud native thinking that these larger scale projects have a much higher chance of su success. So, yeah, so what I'm going to do today in this presentation is actually, you know, share with you a number of observations that I've made with uh, companies that have already built sort of larger, new scale 21st century architectures on top of AWS. And, and that's not just not just the interesting new companies. Uh, it is actually, if you look at uh, large enterprises like Samsung and like Shell and like Ascent and like Unilever, all of them are adopting a cloud native thinking when they engage in building their new architectures. But also, you know, some of these, even some of the younger businesses, there are radical differences between them. Uh, for example, we're very popular with, with gaming companies. Uh, and if you look at the architecture of VUGA versus that of Zynga versus that of Playfish, there are dramatic differences between those architectures. But there are also common pieces. Uh, and actually, I like to believe that, the, for example, the architecture of Playfish is amazing. Now, all of them are these sort of flash-based games, and what uh, Playfish has done is they make it very fine-grained flash objects and store them all in cloud font, such that the delivery, actually, of the games largely happens through CloudFront instead of coming from ser central servers. And then they instrument everything to the max and use a data-driven feedback loop to actually adopt the games in real time. And these guys built fantastic architecture. It goes to the other gaming companies as well. So now well, I'll try to uh, give you a few observations about what I've seen these companies build. Uh, and hopefully, you know, you can take some of that back and, and think about it when you have to build your architectures on top of AWS as well. And actually, it is not just me that sees that there are major differences. Already a few years ago, Gartner, at their IT symposium in Orlando, put up this particular slide. Now, I don't like the difference between enterprise and internet. Now, I would really like to be one column to be resource-oriented, resource-focused, and the other is business focused. Yeah, where you can really see that you know, there are major differences. Those that build new architectures are capable of moving faster, of delivering business value much faster, and with much higher su success. So it is not just the fact that we've seen these observations for a number of years. The larger analyst groups have seen this as well. So, you know, I've called these the uh, commandments of the 21st century architectures. Don't worry, I'm not going to go Old Testament on you guys. Uh, but there are some tablets that have been given to me here. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, 21st century architectures have sort of four different tablets, four different components. Uh, they are controller, controllable. That means that you can use, the business can actually control the architecture. They are resilient, meaning that you, know, you can protect your customer and your business under all conditions. They're adaptive, meaning that you're no longer dependent on fixed resources, but that you can actually be freely able to choose whatever resource you want. And they're data-driven, meaning that they're really based on reality. They're based on data, not on models or not on predictions. So let's take a look at those. Yeah, although there is one sort of and this is still sort of an Old Testament approach to this, thou shall use new concepts to build new applications. Which basically means that if you're going to build your new applications and you're going to build them in the cloud, why don't you take a cloud native thinking? You sort of have to leave that old world, that old world data, cent data center centric, that resource centric thinking behind. And one of those things is, for example, that although an EC2 instance may look like a server to you. If you log into it, you know, it just is, it just has a shell, it has an operating system. It is not a server. It is something that you can switch off. It is a fungible software component. And if you treat it like a server, you are shortening yourself. Yeah. You really have to step, take a step away and think that easy two instances are not servers. Yeah. There are no lights on it. There is an off button though, and that's a really important one as well. So let's take a look at the first uh, tablet. Yeah? So 21st architectures are controllable. 
And, and there's a few sort of commandments in that world that are really important, yeah? First one is thou shall, if that will be for it, no, decompose into small, loosely coupled, stateless building blocks. And it's, this is sort of the foundation of many of the things that we will be talking about after this, yeah? So small means that you need to put your, make your software into units that you want to control. Right? And the, the units of scale, they're the units of fault tolerance. And so you have to think about how small should I be? Well, that could be as small as just a Node.js instance. Yeah, or it could be as small as an Apache server. Yeah, we have, we see customers that run 10 or 15 or 20 or even 100 micros. And where the micros are actually the instance of growth and shrinking. That's the level that they want to control. And some of them actually may even run a number of these Node.js instances in an extra large. Yeah, but these are decisions that they can make after us, but they need to have decomposed the software into small blocks so that they can act, they actually have something to control. Um, you know, uh, how stateless is important. Um, you know, we'll have a customer coming up soon who will actually demonstrate that if you build things as stateless as possible, it's much easier to do things like auto scaling on them. And loosely coupled is, um, is also an important one. And let me give an example about where within Amazon, and, and I have the fortune to be here and have these two hats. You know, I'm also the CTO of Amazon.com, as well as that I'm able to actually talk to you about AWS. So I can give you these examples of Amazon.com, which are often really cool. And so in this case, what we're talking about is that um, IMDB, which is a, uh, an Amazon.com subsidiary, actually provided at one time the what's called theatrical release information on the DVD pages, and now probably on the video on demand pages. So what was the architecture for this? So I'm the beast on one side. We asked them to create a service that would fend this theoretical release information for it. The, the Amazon web servers actually would go out, talk to the uh, IMDB servers, get the data back, render it, put it on the page. Now IMDB hated this because suddenly they were tightly coupled with Amazon.com. If Amazon.com would run a promotion on the DVD page, suddenly IMDB had to start scaling up. And they were not as scalable as that Amazon.com was. Yeah, and so everything that happened at Amazon.com, suddenly IMDB had to run in lockstep with that. There was a tight connection. There was tight synchrony, tight coupling between the two businesses. And so the solution for that was actually relatively simple. Yeah, we had to break the coupling between the two components. And in this case, what, we, what MDB did is they realized that actually that theoretical release information wasn't changing that much. So they just pre-generated all the HTML and dumped it in Amazon S3. And then the only thing that actually the Amazon Web Service had to do is pick up the HTML from, uh, from S3 whenever they needed to, to have that particular data. And the cool thing is, is that now suddenly all of this became AJAX ready as well. Because you could just lose, you learn some, some AJAX, and instead of even having to go through the Amazon.com web servers, yeah, whenever you started scrolling on a page as a customer, the AJAX would start fetching the HTML directly out of Amazon S3. And the cool thing is that this also gives you a red-green de 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 deployment model. Yeah, the ability for, for example, IMTB to just populate a complete different bucket with a whole new way of actually uh, formatting or uh, driving data into those pages. And the only thing that you would have to do is just flip the name to the other bucket. And so, you know, this loose coupling actually makes all of this, all of this life a lot easier. Yeah, the sort of next commandment there is that you shall automate your applications and processes. And it's really important that, you know, I think that we step away from our humans controlling these architectures. Yeah, we, we're actually, no matter how much what we think of each other, we're not that good at it. Yeah? And so it's much more important that if you want to have, for example, business rules to control your architecture, that there is no humans in the loop there. 
Yeah, so automate your process, your applications. Put APIs on them. Put Chef or Puppet Cookbooks on them. Yeah, such that you can have an automated way in actually controlling your architecture, that you as an engineer are not in the loop of actually scaling them. Yeah, and let me give you a rule of thumb there. If you have to log into your instance with SSH or with RDP, your automation is broken. Yeah, so you know for yourself that if you have to log into the node, to in log into the instance to change something, you should have actually automated it. Now, why do we actually want this automation? It is really because this is sort of one of the most important things there. You want to have your business control your architecture. You want to have business rules that decide how your application should scale or how it should scale down. And for example, something like that can be you as a business decide that the latency of this particular page should be between one second and 1.2 seconds. And then the architecture should scale to meet those guarantees. And the rules behind the cover should be to really drive the business value. It shouldn't be an engineer that sits there that says, oops, CPU is going up, let's add some more servers. No, it is really the business side of what you want to deliver that is now capable of actually driving your architecture if you've automated and if you've built into small building blocks. The next sort of observation is that we should actually architect with cost in mind. Now, I like to believe, at least for myself, I know that I'm really, really bad as an engineer, as an engineer in actually managing cost. I like to believe that we are really, really badly trained in it. And I don't mean sort of big O notation kind of cost. I really mean dollars. Give me four fault tolerant algorithms and I can pick them, the best one, almost with my eyes closed. If he then asks me, so what's the difference between algorithm one and algorithm two uh, for the business in terms of dollars if we would have to scale up, I would be clueless. The good thing is that in this new world where all of these resources are actually much finer grain controlled and there is an explicit dollar amount with each of the resources that we have, we can start building these cost aware architectures. And some of the advice that I often give to customers is that you have to start thinking about over which dimension is your company going to make money. And then your costs should actually grow over the same dimension. So as architects, we should be thinking about what is it that the business needs. And now suddenly, with all of these programmable resources, we are actually capable of delivering that to them. We are capable of delivering an architecture where the costs grow over exactly the same dimensions as that the business is going to make money. Yeah, and so, for example, for Amazon, for Amazon.com, that would be that our costs grow over the same dimension as the number of orders that are coming in. Now, now, I can talk a lot about these kind of things, but it's much more exciting to actually get a customer on stage that actually has built architectures that are actually really cost aware. So I would like to introduce to you Ryan Park, the head of uh, operations of Pinterest, to tell you about their architecture. Good morning, my name is Ryan Park and I handle technical operations at Pinterest. Pinterest is an online pin board where you can categorize uh, and collect all of the things that you find interesting and inspiring on the web. Uh, you can organize these pins into boards categorized by topics that you choose and then follow the people that you know or follow boards that match your tastes and that inspire you. Earlier this summer we launched Pinterest on iPad and Android for the first time. And uh, that's helped us continue the explosive growth that we've seen for over a year. Pinterest was built with modern principles of application architecture because we only started writing our software in December of 2009. And we've always been uh, running out of the cloud. So we've been able to take the best design patterns that we've learned from other large scale cloud systems and incorporate them into our application. So a few of the principles that we have used as we've built this, uh, one is flexibility. We try not to make any assumptions about how, uh, about things that we know that could change over time. 
So for example, we know that data is probably going to grow beyond one database and that our internal services in, in sort of our service oriented architecture uh, aren't always going to run on a single server. To make this happen, we use Apache Zookeeper, which is a service discovery tool that lets us register servers as we launch them and direct traffic to whatever servers we have running. And then if we shut servers down or if they're terminated by Amazon, uh, traffic is just redirected and balanced to the rest of the servers in any cluster. We also use Amazon's Elastic Load Balancer to provide the same kind of flexibility for the traffic coming in from the internet. So whether we're running one, one web server or 100, Elastic Load Balancer will balance our traffic evenly across our web server pool. A second architectural principle is scalability. We've worked to make sure that every layer of our system can scale independently of the rest. This took a lot of work and took a lot of decomposition into a service oriented environment rather than one big monolithic application. But now every layer can scale and whether it's a Python service layer that needs more uh, uh, servers on that or whether it's a MySQL database, we can make all of this scale independently of each other. Our databases are broken down into thousands of tiny little shards, each containing a small portion of any one database table. And we have a few hundred of those shards on any one server. But if that server gets too busy with I.O. or gets too full of disk space, then we just can split that data onto multiple servers, thereby increasing the uh, bandwidth we have available to that database. And a third principle is measurability. We try and make sure that we have instrumented all parts of our application so that we can monitor the performance of the application and of the infrastructure services underneath that application. This helps us identify patterns in the way the site is used so that we can make smart choices about the infrastructure that we need to power our site. So these things let us take advantage of what makes the cloud so special. For example, most of our pinners, our users, are in the United States. So the peak traffic for our site is between 6 p.m. to midnight our time. Now when I took this graph, we needed about 80 servers to handle that peak load. But of course, late at night and early in the morning, that, uh, those servers would be wasted. So we've implemented auto scaling, which allows us to shut down on average about 20% of the servers when we're not using them, which since we're paying for these servers by the hour, cuts our expenses by 20% as well for this, this pool of web servers. And it ties this cost structure more specifically to our business goals, to the number of users we're serving and the number of pages that are being delivered. We also take advantage of Amazon's different purchasing models, which help us uh, save money even more. So we use reserved instances for a baseline of capacity that's used most all hours of the day. With these, we prepay a big chunk of, uh, of the cost, but then the hourly fees are much lower, and the, the, uh, there's a resulting savings of 40 to 70% sometimes. We supplement that with on-demand instances and with spot instances, which are charged a market price based on how much demand there is. Now, spot instances are usually much cheaper than the on-demand instances, but they can be shut down if uh, the market price rises or, or capacity is constrained. So we have a watchdog process that spins up on-demand instances when the spot instances aren't available so that we're always having enough capacity to host our website. And the resulting cost savings are pretty massive. Uh, before we did any of this, that pool of 80 web servers was costing us about $54 an hour to run. But after these changes, it drops to $20 an hour or less, a savings of almost two thirds. And it ties our cost more directly to the traffic that we're serving each hour. We've been able to do this because we build our system with cloud friendly principles like flexibility, scalability, and measurability. Thank you very much. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Um, that's pretty amazing, eh? I think. Most people have always thought about the spot market as being something that would be good for batch processing and things like that. But the architectures that they've built, where they actually really go out into the spot market first, before they allocate an on-demand instance, you know, requires, uh, requires some smart 21st century thinking. Yeah? So the second tablet that was given to me by my customers is that you know, 21st century architectures are resilient. Yeah? Basically, that you're capable of protecting your business under all circumstances. And there's a few commandments there. Yeah? Actually, and the first one is a really important one. You shall protect your customers under all circumstances. If you do a business on the internet and you do not have, regardless whether you're actually in the cloud or whether you're on-premise or whatever, if you do not have the protection 
the security and privacy of your customers, not as your first interest, yeah, not as your first priorities. You are putting your business at risk. And I like to believe that we have really great tools and techniques within the cloud to help you protect your business. Yeah, and so, of course, first and foremost, you should be concerned about you know, the privacy about the, the, of your customers or you know, of the sensitive data that lives there for your, uh, for your business. And so most companies that I've seen that take this advice really to heart really make use of encryption. Yeah? If you have sensitive data, and actually this rule of thumb might work just as good on, on, on premise as that it works into the cloud. If you have sensitive data, whether that is customer data or whether it's business sensitive data, you should encrypt that data. Yeah? That's just a good rule of thumb. Even, in the, even on premise, this is just good security hygiene. To protect your customers and your business, you shall encrypt. So when Amazon actually moved on to, uh, onto AWS with, uh, with the web server fleet, no, there's a certain percentage of calls that you need to encrypt because you need to be PCI compliant. Now, I think it's about 15% of, of the calls or something like that. We decided that that was just the rule of thumb should be that we just encrypt everything. So everything, both in transit as well as in rest, is encrypted. Now, and, and you know, modern architectures are powerful enough to actually just handle that. Remember five to ten years ago, we thought about SSL, that that was something that was really expensive. These days, we just use HTTPS all over the place. We don't even think about that that might actually cost resources. And you know what? In the new world, where resources are unconstrained, you can actually spend another one or two instant cycles hours on actually protecting your customers by using encryption. Yeah, and this is another one that actually is sort of, I think, for most of you if you're in this room, but now maybe a sort of a, an obvious one. Yeah? There is a reason why we give you these availability zones. Yeah? <laughs> Thank you. There's a reason. So use them. Please. Yes. If you go to production, you shall go into production into at least two availability zones. Ah. How easy is that? Because they're just programmable concepts. You don't need to do any additional work for it. You, know, you shall use two availability zones if you go to production to protect your business. You know, bad things happen. Ah, I've said this in the past, you know, there's this is a famous quote that travels around that, you know, everything fails all the time. And it's not just our stuff, you know. It is just bugs and things like that. We'll get to that a little bit later. And the other thing is that actually another tool that we give you next to the availability zones that you absolutely should make use of. We give you very fine-grained security tools. Now, of course, we take care with the shared responsibility model. You know, we take care of all the certification and the security in our data centers and all these things. And, and Andy talked also about that yesterday in, 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 in great depth. But we also give you very fine-grained security tools such that you can protect your own business. You know what? If, if firewalls would be the way to go, yeah, then we would still have moats around our cities. We don't have those anymore. There's a reason for that. Yeah? If you believe that a firewall is sufficient protection to protect your business, you're putting yourself at risk. If you look at most of the, uh, most of the articles and most of the research, you know, most um, intrusions happen through social engineering. Yeah. And so make use of very fine-grained security tools from the beginning. There is no reason why you should not architect your system to be secure from the get-go. It's not your security team that should do this for you. You can use these tools yourself. Yeah, and we, we, we launch instances with all ports shut down, you know, with, with everything controlled. Every opening up of your architecture is something that you will do. You will do that explicitly. Yeah, so take care of that. Take care of your customers. And in the new world, I think, where we uh, where all our requirements change all the time. Yeah, uh, customers change their mind, um, environment changes, 
business decisions are being made. Uh, in the past, it would be almost impossible to meet those guarantees, to meet those re requests. And why? Because we were in this sort of style of development that was sort of next generation thinking. Like, oh, you know, we'll do this in the next cycle of when we build this application. I think, you know, that is sort of a thinking of the past. Definitely with lots of the new lean concepts being brought into businesses, yeah, where you will bring a product to market in a robust but with a version, but with a limited feature set, and then quickly iterate with your customers to go into a particular di di direction. Now, if that's the new way that businesses are actually want to build their products, yeah, after all, these days, you know, there's an abundance of products in the market. Competition is murderous. Yeah, there's increasing consumer choice. The likelihood whether your product is going to be successful or not is highly uncertain. So you need to have a development methodology that actually follows that uncertainty, that really deals well with uncertainty. And so we've got, um, you know, and the fact that you're no longer controlled by your resources allows you to be this flexible. And for example, one of our customers in Australia has really uh, pushed this a bit to the max. Can I show you that slide? Yes. This is um, the guys of realestate.com in Australia. There's actually two of them around here. Uh, they are absolutely some of the world's best experts in Agile. They have a distributed development environment that runs all over the world where all of their engineers are collaborating together. And what they do on top of AWS, that's where they use this for, they do continuous build and integration. Whenever you check something in, it automatically goes through all the steps. And if it meets all the checks in those steps, it will also be de deployed into production. And it's not only them that actually do this. If you look at uh, sort of uh, Amazon.com, we do at Amazon.com a, a new code deployment every 11 seconds. Yeah? The sort of the max number of that is that we do a bit more than a thousand uh, deployments in a single hour. The mean number of nodes in a deployment is well over 10,000, and sort of the max runs up to 30,000 nodes. Yeah, so. This is a, a complex environment to manage, yeah? But you do continuous deployment because you want to get your features and your fixes out to customers immediately. And actually, if you look at, uh, if you look at how we actually used to do deployments, this is uh, sort of, uh, you know, the, the new architecture where the web servers run in three different availability zones, and we would use something that was called phased deployment, where we would do a one-box deployment, and test whether everything is going okay, and then you would actually slowly phase in the new software. So that sort of looks like this. Yeah. So you start at the end, and then one by one, you actually roll your deployment through that particular world. Yeah, and then in the end, you would end up with new code everywhere. Now, we were really good at that, but it is actually a very complex uh, workflow, and it is very, very error-prone. And it is not 21st century. Now, how would a cloud-native cloud deployment look like? You, know, you have all these resources at your, uh, at your disposal. How would you deploy this? Yeah. So you just fire up a whole bunch of EC2 instances with the new code. Now, you have them at your disposal anyway. You just fire up a whole bunch of them. And you've got them running, and you test them, you do a bit of uh, test traffic to them, and then you see whether the code works well, and what you do, you just flip the load balancer. Yeah, and immediately the whole site is actually served from this new code. And if something goes wrong at this moment, you had been smart because you just left the old environment running for a while until you were certain that everything was okay, you would just flip back if something goes wrong. In the old world, where we were doing this phase deployment, rollback was almost impossible. Rollback here is one single API call. And actually, to demonstrate to you that this is not something that only a, a large company or a large development group like Amazon.com can do, um, I would like to uh, invite on stage ADS's uh, chief data scientist, Dr. Matt Wood, who will be giving you 
a live demo of this. There ain't a future in your front. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Werner. Um, so we've heard some fantastic stories uh, in the keynote this morning and from customers in the keynote yesterday and in the breakout sessions about how they're taking this approach of developing 21st century architectures, which are taking advantage of programmable infrastructure, automation, and price awareness to build sophisticated, scalable applications. However, sophisticated doesn't necessarily mean, mean, need to mean complex. In fact, decoupled, stateless architectures have a certain grace and simplicity of their own, which make them very easy to manage, very easy to create, and very easy to deploy new versions into production as you go along. So what we thought we'd do is show you that you don't need to be a billion dollar uh, fully engineered organization to be able to take advantage of some of these continuous deployment uh, programmable resources. So we're going to try and do a live demo. So if we could bring up the, uh, the console here. Uh, if you're new to AWS, this is the uh, web-based management console. Uh, everybody gets access to it. Uh, this is EC2. And what we have deployed here is uh, an application. Uh, it's a uh, relatively simple uh, photo management application. It's running live on EC2. It allows customers to upload uh, photos and then allows them to build out um, photo, digital photo books uh, up on the web. What we have here deployed uh, is version one of the application. Uh, we use the CloudFormation templating tool. This is a fantastic tool which allows you to specify the full stack of your application in a couple of lines of JSON format. The great thing about CloudFormation is it allows you to automate and, uh, the entire deployment of your application. You can do, in a couple of clicks, spin up your full production stack uh, item potently and then roll back as necessary. Uh, you can pass in uh, some features, uh, the instance type that you want to use, the number of instances you want to deploy. Uh, but the key here is that your resource configuration, your infrastructure configuration, eventually becomes uh, capable of being put under version control. So your infrastructure, as Werner mentioned earlier, becomes just another programmable resource which you're accessing, along with your data and all the other APIs that your applications are using. You can place your full uh, codified stack under version control and quickly reproduce it as and when you need to. In addition to that, CloudFormation calls Chef uh, when the instances are launched. Uh, that bootstraps from just an Amazon Linux AMI, a uh, cold uh, bootstrap, installs all the dependencies that we need, installs the application, spins it up, pulls down the latest version from S3 and gets you up and running. Again, the great thing here is that not only is your infrastructure configuration placed under version control, but also your bootstrap your environment, your execution environment for your application is packaged up and placed under version control. This makes it super easy to manage. So we use that. We span up uh, 10 instances, as you can see here. Uh, we have uh, the live app running. Uh, we've deployed them uh, as, as best practice states across two uh, availability zones. This is running in US East. We're in US East 1B. And my personal favorite, US East 1E. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to try and show you a little bit about um, how you can deploy a new version into production. So what we have here is these instances registered behind a load balancer. Uh, we went ahead and span up that load balancer in our CloudFormation script. Uh, you can see here that we have the instances registered across the availability zones. They've all been registered. And the Elastic Load Balancer will do a health check on the application when, those, uh, when they're registered with it uh, to make sure that the, not only the instance is available, but the application is up and ready to respond. So we have that all set up nice and easily. This is a very typical web application architecture, a load balance, stateless architecture underneath the load balancer, which means we can add and remove capacity as and when we need to. This is basically the, um, the, the scaffold onto which you can start building more of these 21st century architectures that we're discussing here today. This is where you can start to add on the uh, cost awareness, the continual deployment. But this is really the, the foundational scaffold that you need to have in place. So um, because we have uh, capacity available to us, uh, we're actually driving uh, some fake traffic to our website with a robot army of instances uh, around the world. Uh, they're driving some traffic here. We tried to make it as representative of real traffic as we could. Uh, the application itself is running on top of DynamoDB, uh, the Amazon uh, NoSQL managed data store. And what we're going to try and do is show you a little bit about how we deploy a new version. So um, what we have. Inside the application is an image processing pipeline. 
Uh, when photos are uploaded, either from mobile apps or from a desktop, the application takes that photo, it resizes it for the various different formats that it's going to be displayed in, uh, it does some color detection and some other optimizations of the images uh, for the customers. And we want to be able to make that as swift as we can for our customers. So we have our robot army sending those photos into our service. Uh, we have image processing up and running. And as you saw earlier, we have some metrics delivered by the CloudWatch service, uh, which are telling us how much CPU we're using, how much network we're using, and all the rest of it. That's available on all instances for free, a five minute resolution, but you can increase it to one minute resolution uh, as and when it's necessary. But in a programmable environment that we have uh, on AWS, we can add an additional layer to our instance metrics. The instance metrics will tell us how much CPU we're using, how much disk IO we're using. But in a programmable, business focused environment, we can start to relate those infrastructure metrics back into our business metrics. So, what we have here is a very simple graph. Uh, it's showing the average cost of processing a thousand of the images that are loaded up into the phone, into the application. Now, you can't see it here because it's relatively stable. This is actually updating in real time from logs that we have stored uh, back in DynamoDB. So, what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to launch version two of our application live here on stage at reInvent. Um, we have uh, a second version deployed. We took our same uh, CloudFormation template. We span up a second stack. This could have included optimizations to our pipeline, things like that. However, we chose to take the opportunity to uh, experiment with a different instance type. So here we've, uh, as you can see running, we've chosen to use the new uh, next generation M3 large instance. And we're going to see if that makes a differentiating effect in the number of images that our applications can process, the time it takes for them to be processed, and the cost for us as a business. So Simone is going to go ahead and add that in to the, uh, to the load balancer. We're going to launch it up. All we have to do is uh, cycle down here, choose the instance that we want to add. Uh, of course, we're going to actually put this as a canary in the coal mine uh, into our live application environment. So we're going to put it in two availability zones. And then we're going to see what effect that has on the metrics. So we're going to go ahead, click OK. The load balancer will start to uh, register those. It'll start to send the health check URLs. And then what we'll see is, brace yourselves, a massive decrease, small but perfectly formed. So here we can see a decrease in the cost of processing the images because our M3 large instance is able to do more per unit time. So our canary has done very well here. And in the production environment, we're actually delivering a better experience to our customers. And we've been able to use the metrics that our application is collecting to relate those back to our high level business metrics. How is our application performing? What is the cost to us uh, back, in the, uh, back in the office? So we're going to go ahead and we're going to register the, uh, all the rest of the instances back into the load balancer. This is the rest of the M3 large version two instances into the load balancer. Add them in, click save, and we're done. Now I know what you're thinking. Matt, what's that done to the graph? Well, I'm going to tell you. Those are being registered. The uh, robot army will start delivering traffic to it. And as you can see, as soon as they register OK with the health check, uh, then the applications start responding. You can see our average cost of processing these images to our company starts to decrease. Now, we did this in just a couple of clicks in a web based management console. And we're doing it here to, uh, uh, to show you how to do it in the console very, very easily. But of course, you could automate all of this. We have programmable infrastructure. We have all of this available at the end of a web service, as our name suggests. You can also use the Amazon SDKs, which are language specific abstractions to allow you to run in Python and Ruby and Java and all the rest of it. So uh, we're very happy. Quick review. We have our second version deployed alongside our first version. Uh, we could swap out that first version of those instances, just take them out of the load balancer, see how the application performs over time, and maybe roll back if necessary. Uh, but I think looking at the graph, we're pretty happy with how things are going. So I'm going to ask Simone to terminate those instances. Simply terminate them. In a decoupled environment, in a stateless environment that we've created here, you shouldn't become too attached to your compute infrastructure. Uh, it's not very healthy for a start, but also you don't want to be uh, attached. Compute is essentially, uh, essentially a fungible resource. It's uh, something that you can swap out at, at necessary. And as you can see, as those instances start to terminate, the traffic goes on to our, uh, our full new version two running on those M3 large instances, and our cost uh, starts to come down even more. So we've been able to deploy a fresh version continually. We've been able to do that manually, but we can also automate it going forwards. And you can see how in a 21st century architecture, you're able to relate, relate that back to your business metrics. Uh, so I hope to see you soon, and thanks a lot for the demo. Thanks, guys.
as you can see, you know, if they can do it, you can do it. Yeah. So the, another piece of actually protecting your business, yeah, making sure that your architectures are resilient, is about failures. You know, things fail. And, and I, I come out of the, uh, the old resource constrained world. In that world, a lot more things actually failed. You know, it could be a memory chip, it could be your processor, it could be your, your power supply, it could be someone tripping over a rack. Um, and, and in every possible configuration, you know, things would fail. And the thing is that in the new world, you may have um, reduced the number of those failures. You know, the fact that you're able to switch between instances, between instance types, between, is, is makes these things a lot easier. But I've, there's also something that I've learned from all these other companies that are now building these sort of new architectures is that they realize that their code is full of failures. It's just you don't know that they're there yet. Yeah? And, and I think we've, we've seen some of these things uh, around Amazon as well. You know, we have a transformer that explodes on one side, and on the other side, you discover a bug in RDS. And it doesn't really matter what the steps are in between. It is there is always, always a failure waiting around the corner. And as such, building your, your architectures such that you're capable of quickly scaling up for, um, for full tolerant reasons and for taking over particular roles is, uh, is rather important. Something else that I've, um, that I've learned from a number of these companies is that uh, what they are doing, the way that they are looking at failure, is they don't look at failure as an exception. Yeah, if you've ever uh, looked at some code that has lived for a while, maybe the, the business rules in that code are about 10 lines or 20 lines, and the exception handling is about 20 pages long. Yeah, this typical code that has survived for a long time. And, and mem quite a few of those code paths have to do with particular failures happening. And what I've seen from some of these companies that have been able to really look at these things from more from a stateless perspective is that they just treat failure as another form of deployment. Yeah? That it is not an exception. These are things, there are many, many events happening in your system that will require you to reboot, to restart, and to make your system survivable. So the num reducing the number of code paths such that you do not treat failure as something else or than normal operation is something that will help your systems become resilient. Now at Amazon, from the beginning, we've run one of the, what I like to believe, world's largest distributed systems that has to stay up all the time. And so to give you a glimpse into what I consider almost the 10th world wonder of, of our age, Amazon S3. I'd like to invite on stage Vice President of Storage, Alyssa Henry. All right, good morning. Super excited to be here today and share, to share a little bit about how we've designed and architected Amazon S3. So from the beginning, one of the key things that we did in designing S3 was to design for resiliency. You know, at large scale, failures, even uh, low probability or even regular failures happen fairly frequently. For example, like a disk drive failure, a routine failure like that, we can have disk drive failures many, 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 many times a day. So we have to architect for that from the beginning. And at large scale, even improbable events, things that don't happen very often, they still happen. You get enough dice rolls that you even see these sort of low probability events. You know, if you think about it, you think about S3 now storing more than a trillion objects, if there's some sort of thing that happens, say, once in a billion, you could now have a thousand or more occurrences of that, right? So you've got to think about these things up front when you're designing for scale and resiliency. 
So we use a number of different techniques within Amazon S3 to mitigate failures. But one of the ones that's sort of most heavily used is using redundancy. So you've heard Werner talk about using multiple availability zones. And with S3, we absolutely do. So S3 runs in multiple availability zones within a single region. And you can see this is a conceptual picture of what the S3 architecture looks like. You can see it's repeated in, in multiple zones. So let me quickly walk you through. There we go. Is it going? There we go. Uh, quickly walk you through how a request gets processed with S3. So you've got your server, and let's say you're issuing a put request. Based on DNS, it gets routed to a load balancer within one of our availability zones. From there, a load balancer routes it to an available web server. From there, the web server sends the request for the put down into our storage service. The storage service then durably, I missed, my slide's gone. Anyway, um, then durably stores the data across multiple servers in multiple facilities. From there, then the, uh, then the web server calls the index service, where the index service will then durably store it, the index information, which is the ID from the storage service plus the key name and user metadata across multiple servers in multiple facilities. From there, it returns the return success to the web server, and then the web server returns success for you, letting you know that your object has been durably stored in multiple servers in multiple facilities. So then, let's think about what happens if failure occurs in some component within the system. So for example, if a web server is offline or some portion of the index servers or storage servers are offline, what the system will do is just automatically route around those failed servers, and there's enough redundancy in the system that it's fine. Another server can process the request. You can take this to the extreme, uh, extreme such that even if an entire availability zone fails, system just keeps working, everything's fine. We now shift DNS weights so that all the requests are routed to the remaining availability zones in the region, and we capacity plan those availability zones such that we can continue to process you know, peak request loads even when one of our availability zones is totally offline. So beyond designing for resiliency, another key thing that we designed for with Amazon S3 was adaptability. You know, you often don't know everything, you know, when you set out to build or launch a service, and things change over time. There were a number of things that we, that we didn't know for sure when we launched S3. What we did know is that things were likely to change, and so that was, it was important to build the service in such a way that we had loosely coupled services which would allow us to adapt and evolve it over time. You know, when we built S3, you know, again, we had to think about what, what the use cases were going to be like, what, how customers would use it, and we had to make a number of different assumptions uh, in order to build the service. And one of the things that we had to kind of figure out was, you know, to what scale do we need to build it, and how many objects does the system need to store? Now, we always believed that S3 had the potential to be a very, very large service, and we designed it to do that. But we made some assumptions around what uh, average object size would be within the service, and then how that would translate into how many objects we'd have to store per gigabyte or per petabyte. Well, it turns out um, that's one of those places where mm, our assumptions were maybe a little off. Um, because when we built the system, we designed it to support 20 billion objects. A little off from where we uh, are today and where we expect it to be. And so one of the things that we had to do is we, we need to go evolve the system. So after about nine months, we already had close to three billion objects in the system. We said, gosh, you know, we really need to leverage that loosely coupled architecture, make some changes to support the growth that we're seeing. So what we did is, huh? is we built a new storage service within Amazon S3. So you can see here we've got, you know, all the original components, plus now there's this new loosely coupled underlying storage service. So we, it sits side by side with the old one. We then gradually started routing new incoming requests to the new storage service, making sure that everything was working right, starting with low priority requests and moving to um, higher priority ones. And over time, shifted all of the new writes into the new storage service. 
and then ultimately migrated all the data in the existing or in the original storage service into the new one. Once all the data was migrated, we shut down the old one and we had um, a single storage service within the service again. And what's interesting about this is that you know, after we were done, customers got a number of benefits. They saw higher reliability of the service, they saw better performance, and it enabled a number of these changes enabled us to lower prices for customers. So what's really cool about this is you know, customers didn't have to do anything. You didn't have to go out and buy the next upgrade, you know, V2 of Amazon S3, right? Uh, you didn't have to go do the migration yourself. You just got it all for free. It just worked. Things just got better, right? And that's one of the differences with the cloud versus how traditional ID has been done. You know, more recently, uh, we did it again when we added support for Amazon Glacier within Amazon S3. Once again, we just added a new storage service within the service and then updated the API such that customers could say, okay, I want to migrate the data from, uh, from the existing storage service into Amazon Glacier. So that's a quick look at how we've designed Amazon S3 for resiliency and adaptability. Thank you. Thanks, Werner. Thanks, Alyssa. Uh, S3 is amazing. Oh, really, this is... Um, if there's ever an architecture, ever something being built that serves so many people, so many businesses, hundreds of thousands of businesses have built on top of S3. Uh, and so, you know, the, the responsibility on our shoulders there is, is pretty heavy. You know, many of you have built your business your, 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 for your livelihood depend on, on S3 operating well. And as you can imagine, we take that, take that extremely serious. So 21st century architectures are adaptive. And with that, I don't really mean that they, they adapt to different circumstances, but you, are, you ensure that they are not constrained. And actually, I would like to start off with, a, uh, with something more famous. You guys know what this is? Objects shall not be replicated beyond necessity. Occam's razor. Uh, and of course, there's lots of... Uh, Lots of discussion always been about what Occam's razor really means and, and how people can misuse it in presentations like this one. Um, what it really means is that you should not make things more complex than it should be. Or you should make it as simpler, but not as simple as that it can be. In case, I think, from my point of view, what it always said is that those that assume the least are likely to run in the least failures. Yeah, if you are not constraining yourself up front, you're likely to build architectures that are much more successful down the road. So assume nothing. Now, sometimes that's hard, especially in the old world where you had to make all sorts of assumptions because you had to buy hardware, you had to buy networks, you had to know how far your data centers were apart from each other and, and how many people you had, could you manage them? So you had to make all these assumptions. Or even, you know, even at architectural level, you were making assumptions. For example, academics have been really great in writing algorithms that said failures are not correlated. Well, believe me, if you've made, if you look at an algorithm that where in the paper it says, and we make the assumption up front that failures are not correlated, uh, you can throw that paper away. Yeah, because in reality, failures are correlated. Uh, racks go down. How rooms in data center may lose, will lose, will lose, lose power. There's all sorts of containers that may actually make failures, uh, uh, correlated failures. And as I said earlier, your code is full of failures. And where one failure may happen, that may trigger a whole range of others. And if you're able to assume nothing, you're actually able to maybe keep the blast radius of those failures to a minimum. So assume nothing. Assume not on what kind of architecture you're running. And it's great because yesterday, I don't know if you remember, in the keynote um, of Andy Jassy where Reed Hastings came up and, and Andy asked Reed about how, how, how he saw the future of cloud computing. He talked about this compiler for instance types. Yeah, where he said it's actually kind of assembly level that we're talking about instance types. Now, I like to believe that we are already pretty good in that. And especially, I think, something that you should not assume up front is which instance type you're going to use. 
You just built your software. You built your architecture. Just purely focused on your customer, on what you need to deliver. And then you use late binding to actually decide at the moment that you have your architecture, what would be the ideal instance type to run at. Because if you saw earlier on in the demo that Matt and Simone gave, yeah, they were able actually to switch out the architecture by running on a different instance type and actually get more business value out of it. They could do that because they had not assumed up front which instance type they were going to use. And um, you know, something in this is that you're also able to change your mind whenever you want. You're not locked into anything. Yeah, and actually, you know what's even better? You're capable of making, you're allowed to make mistakes. Mistakes in the past at Amazon, if I would make mistakes in capacity planning, that would be a disaster. Yeah. In 2008, for example, you know, when, um, when suddenly the rise of e-commerce took a big acceleration uh, after the crisis, uh, if we would have, if I would have had to do capacity planning in the old style way, I may have actually made massive mistakes. But in the new world, you can no longer make these mistakes with capacity planning because capacity is no longer a constrained resource. And so I would like to uh, invite someone on stage that has over time actually changed his mind, qu mind quite a few times. Um, Brad Jefferson is CEO of Animoto and I'd like to invite him on stage. It's great to be here. At Animoto, our vision is to inspire people to share their lives using the magic of video. And we do this by making it really easy to create and share extraordinary videos of your life or for your business. So for example, the video that Werner showed earlier today, he was very kind to give us credit for creating that. But the reality is any of you, without any prior knowledge of Animoto, could have created that video in just a few minutes. It's really that easy. And so while that's sort of magical to our customers, there's obviously a lot going on under the hood. And so I wanted to take you through some of that and some of the changes we've made and why. This is our architecture within Amazon Web Services. Um, I'm not going to go through all of it. We've made a lot of innovations over the last five years. Really what I want to focus on is our render um, architecture. And to, in order to create really great looking cinematic narratives, it requires us to custom render each video frame by frame. And, and so we take the photos, the video, the music, the design elements, and we put it all together, custom render it for you. Um, and in order to do that, it requires a single server to do every single video. So you can imagine what happens when a lot of our customers want to create lots of videos at the same time. This is what happened in 2008. And for folks who have been on AWS for a while, you've probably seen this graph before. So we were marching along, and we created an integration on Facebook. And when we launched it, over the course of three days, all of a sudden we brought on 750,000 new Facebook users, each of whom created at least one video each. And our EC2 instance count at that point was about, our steady state was about 100 instances. And all of a sudden, when we launched, it started to spike to 1,000, then 2,000, then 3,000, then 4,000. And later that year, all the way to 5,000. We didn't, we didn't miss a step. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our, our history and, and how we got to that point. Because a few months earlier, we actually would have been in big trouble. In 2007, when we originally launched, we were built fully on Amazon Web Services, but with one exception, which was our render architecture. So this is me actually building one of those boxes under the careful watch of our CTO, Stevie. That's me praying that this was going to work and that it was actually a good investment. It did work for launch, but it was a terrible investment. We had no business building servers. I don't even know how. That's why Steve had to watch. I had no idea how to do it. So for, for as we started watching our numbers, we, we got freaked out because we needed to scale past our capacity. And so we actually pulled all the, uh, um, we, we re-architected so that all of our servers, render servers, were now within Amazon Web Services using the extra large instances. 
And it's a really good thing that we did that because it was only a few months later that we saw that spike. We would have been dead if we hadn't done that. The other thing that it helped us do was just really focus on our core competency is what we're good at is building great videos for you. We're not good at building servers. And so we, at the time, we had less than 10 people in the company, and it was just a waste of time to focus on hardware. In 2009, we launched the high CPU extra large instances, and that did two things for us. Uh, number one is it meant that rendering times decreased pretty significantly. So prior to that, to create a two minute video, it would take about 16 minutes to render. And with this change, it meant four minutes to render. And so that was great because our customers would create more videos, they would share them more frequently. The other thing it did is it allowed us to render video in higher resolution. So we were able to render video at 480p or DVD quality, which was a customer requested feature. Uh, so one interesting thing though is we realized that our, our cost per video actually went up. And so when we looked at that, we realized that the majority of our videos didn't require the firepower of, of large instances. And so what we did is we routed the smaller videos, the lower resolution videos to these medium instances, and it took a little bit longer to render those out, 10 or 20 percent longer, but our savings was half. And so uh, it was great to sort of bifurcate that traffic. And then last year, we were really pleased that AWS launched uh, GPU, because what GPU allows us to do is just render videos a lot faster. There's multiple uh, advances for us. So number one is, again, we can create videos faster. So now we can actually render out a video faster than real time. So for a two minute video, we can give you a preview back under two minutes. And we've done some cool, um, uh, some cool tricks so that we'll actually start rendering, uh, streaming the video back to you before it's even finished rendering. We also, uh, the resolution now increases so we can get all the way to uh, HD 720p, which is our customers love. Um, and then our, from an artistic perspective, it's been a great change because we're able to just iterate a lot more quickly. So our motion graphic artists can now create styles um, a lot faster and so we can release styles to our customers faster. And then lastly, there was a, a cost of goods um, sold reduction. So our gross margins went up, which is always great. So that all leads to now. Uh, yesterday, I had the honor of uh, announcing a new product that we created here on the live stage. It's called Animoto Best of 2012 Facebook Videos. And basically what it is, is on Animoto.com, you click a button at Animoto.com slash 2012, and it, it, it looks through your Facebook profile and finds all your best moments from the year of 2012, and then renders out a beautiful video, a video recap of your year. And uh, as you know, Facebook has a lot of users, a billion monthly actives, they upload 300 million photos per day. So we're hoping a good number of them try it out. And so for you Facebook users out here, I'd ask that you go to Animoto.com slash 2012, try it out, and help us push the limits of EC2 again. Thanks. Great service, great business. You guys saw the video um, at, at the beginning. That's the kind of quality you get. Um, and I really would like to make a plug for the, uh, for the new service or the new feature that they launched yesterday. Uh, if you're a Facebook user, you just owe it to yourself to just try out um, to get a video of the best moment of your 2012 timeline. Now, I know that Brad, uh, you know, they started already in 2006, 2007. Uh, we didn't run a startup challenge in those days. But if we had, I'm pretty sure that uh, he would have uh, taken part in it. He may even have won. So if you're a young business, uh, you should really consider submitting an application to the AWS Startup Challenge. Uh, it's a competition. You're able to win 50,000 in cash and 50,000 in EC2 credits. Uh, you get support from our, uh, from our solution architects and things like that to actually help you build your business. So if you're a startup, really consider yourself uh, eligible to actually submit yourself to the uh, AWS Startup Challenge. The submission deadline is seven days from now. So go to work. And actually, I think that if, uh, if Brad would have known this, uh, he would have actually had some choices of some new instance types. So today, we're actually like to announce two new easy to instance types that are really at the end of the spectrum and that will really help a number of customers build amazing new applications. So the first one of that is a cluster high memory instance type. That one has 
240 gigabytes of RAM. Yeah, and it sits on 220 gigabytes SSDs. Yeah? If you run any application that has, requires large scale in memory processing, like many, many of the new in memory databases or the new in memory analytics tools, this is the instance type you want to use. And the second new instance type that we're launching is the one for high storage. Yeah? This one still has yeah, 170 gigabytes of RAM, which is substantial, but it actually sits on 24 2 terabyte hard disks. So you get 48 terabytes of data, of disk space. This is really, really well suited for those of you that need to do very, very, very large scale analytics. And many of you are running these massive EMR, these elastic map reduce tasks, have asked us for these kind of instance types. And I really hope that you guys will put them to good use. So, new instance types, first thing today. So there's one thing left, there's one tablet left, and that is the data-driven tablet. You know, 21st century architectures, the way that I have seen them evolve, are all what we call realistic. They're all based on factual data. They're all driven by feedback loops that are taking in real life data from the application. And whether that is at a system level or whether that is at a business level, yeah, as you saw earlier, um, both Brad as well as in the demo we gave earlier, the feedback loop about cost and the feedback loop about quality of service that you deliver is really important. So to be able to do that, what you need to do is instrument everything all the time. Make sure if you do not collect the data, you cannot act on it. So we give you all these tools to push all these metrics into CloudWatch. Make use of it. And not just your low level system metrics, not just the memory size of your JVM. Push your business level metrics into there as well. Such that you can even have, for example, your elastic load balancers make decisions based on business level metrics that you insert into CloudWatch. And this is, uh, the next one is just sort of a lesson that I've learned the hard way, that we at Amazon.com learned the hard way. If you then collect metrics, uh, don't just look at the average or the mean. You know, the average latency to your customers just means that 50% of your customers are getting a worse experience. You need to know how much worse. It is essential to look at the whole distribution and especially to look at the end of the distribution to see what is the worst experience my customers are getting. And then you need to instill an engineering culture to actually try to control that end of the distribution. Yeah, at Amazon.com and at uh, AWS, we religiously look at the 99.9% .9 percentile. And we take, do all of our engineering to control that end of the distribution. And in trying, instead of always focusing on the average and try to improve that, we try to improve the 99 percentile, knowing that if we're able to improve that one, that often the whole distribution will shift along with that. You need to control the worst experience that your customers are getting. And this one is something that I've, uh, I've heard from many of our customers. And uh, I don't know which one of you went uh, yesterday to the session by Etsy. Um, Etsy has built a large number of uh, really great tools around EMR. Uh, they're open source. I urge you to take a look at that if you're doing uh, this kind of uh, style of log file processing. But the folks at Etsy are, are really promoting that, you know, you should put everything in your log files. Not just the fact that what normally Apache gives you or not just the, the, the normal user agent and things like that. You should actually add all sorts of system and business level metrics to that line in your log file. Because if you do that, you can then later on use your analytics to get a detailed experience, detailed knowledge about how your application was performing over time under certain conditions and you can actually create feedback loops over, out of that. Now I know that for you, many of you, 
Um, now, creating these log files, especially if, uh, if you have a large number of instances running, and then moving those log files into S3 and then getting them into EMR is actually um, a troublesome. Yeah, it's not that easy to do. And I've seen, uh, for example, the folks at Netflix build pretty extensive architectures to really make sure that those log files arrive there, that they go for first stage of processing and then for second stage of processing. All of that is actually uh, not that trivial. And there is actually, it's not just log files, there is actually data everywhere. Yeah, there's many data sources, whether it's your log files, uh, whether it sits in different databases, and often you need to get it from, from one place where you have it through a number of steps periodically into another place. You need to get it into analytics tools, you need to get it into DynamoDB, um, and all of that. So to actually, we understand that this is hard for you to do. There's a lot of muck in that world that you have to deal with. So with that, I would like to announce a new service today that will help you with this. Uh, we are announcing today AWS Data Pipeline. The Data Pipeline is a data-driven workflow service that helps you periodically move, the, or that helps you move data through several processing steps to the destination where you want to get it. We know that you have many different data sources that you need to take into account. You need to get it to your analytics engine. You need to get it into a different database. You, need, you may want to put it into uh, Amazon Redshift. All of these things are important to you. And so this service allows you to create automated schedules. It allows you to handle resilience there. It does failure handling for you. Uh, for example, in my earlier example, if you have log files that sit in your node, it will move the log files into S3 and then you can have it run a analytics schedule every hour or at the end of the day. And if things go wrong, if log files are not there, if the data is not there, if your analytics doesn't complete, you can actually, you, you get reports on the failure handling of that. And it's, it's easily integrated with existing AWS data sources but it also connects easily with third party, for example, analytics tools, as well as on-premise resources. Yeah, it doesn't need to be that your, re, uh, your data sources only need to be in AWS. So I'm really excited about AWS Data Pipeline, and I would like to um, invite back on stage um, AWS's chief data scientist, to actually, uh, Matt Wood, to actually demonstrate this to you in real life. Hi. So, as Vernon just announced, uh, AWS Data Pipeline is a lightweight web service that allows you to start integrating the disparate data sources that collect up around your applications. So that could be data that's stored in DynamoDB, that's stored in Amazon Redshift, or stored in text files inside Amazon S3. So what we wanted to do uh, is pull up uh, AWS Data Pipeline, uh, if we could pull up the demo, and we're going to give you a quick guided tour of some of the features here. Now again, we're working here inside the web browser, uh, but everything that you're going to see can be driven uh, by uh, command line tools, but also through web service calls as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new pipeline, and then we're going to start hooking up the four components of an AWS data pipeline. The first is a data source. The second is a business operation that you want to apply to that data source. The third is the preconditions that have to be uh, met for that pipeline to run. And the fourth is the schedule on which you want that pipeline to run as well. So here inside the, uh, inside the console, uh, we are um, uh, very pleased to uh, produce a drag and drop interface for you to start building out these pipelines. So we have uh, over on the left-hand side a canvas onto which you can drag and drop your data nodes or your business level activities, your ETL operations. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have the configuration of those different components. So what we're going to do, first of all, is use uh, a brilliant feature of uh, AWS Data Pipeline, which allows you to use pre-made templates uh, to recreate data pipelines. So we've got a few loaded up here. And I'm going to start with one which is a very common request from customers. And that is to be able to automate the replication of data in DynamoDB uh, over to S3. So what we've done here is we've created uh, a data node over on the left-hand side. That's our DynamoDB table. On, in the middle there, we have our activity. Uh, this is our business logic, which is actually going to perform the replication. 
And on the right hand side, we have our S3 bucket, uh, which is going to be the ultimate destination of the data that we're going to pull out and replicate from DynamoDB. So Simone is now going to go ahead and configure this. You can see it's uh, relatively straightforward. We just click on the data nodes. Uh, we give it the name of the table in DynamoDB that we want to replicate. Uh, we can go through to the resources. Now, because DynamoDB has uh, unlimited scale, uh, you can put as much data in there as you like and still expect single digit millisecond latencies for your puts and gets. Uh, that means that we have to have a scalable way of getting that data out. And in this case, we're going to use uh, Amazon Elastic MapReduce, which is a managed Hadoop service. This is built for data, uh, but designed for humans to use. And here we're going to orchestrate an entire Elastic MapReduce cluster, which the data pipeline is going to spin up on our behalf, and then it's going to start running through uh, via a Hive query, if you're familiar with that technology, uh, to start moving that data from DynamoDB uh, into uh, an S3 bucket. So we've configured our data source, our business logic, which is going to perform the, uh, the replication, and also the destination bucket in the S3 data. The th other component is the scheduling. So um, uh, AWS Data Pipeline allows you to run these, uh, these, these data pipelines on an automated schedule. There's no need to run instances to control this schedule. Everything's controlled by AWS Data Pipeline. So we're going to go ahead, specify our schedule here. It's going to run uh, every day at midnight. And all we have to do now is click on activate. That'll get pushed into production, and it'll start to be scheduled. You won't provision any instances until it's time to do it, and away you go. So that's a very easy way of using a template for a very common task. But I also wanted to show you how to build one of these from scratch. So we're going to go ahead, and we're going to create a new pipeline. Now, in this case, we're going to build a slightly more uh, complex pipeline, uh, which is going to take advantage of the preconditions which we can apply on certain components of that pipeline. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to create a new data node. And we're going to take the sort of application logs that the majority of your applications are going to be generating. They're probably log rotating off application servers back into S3. And up till now, it's become very challenging to start integrating those data sets, either because of their location, the disparate data sources, the format that that data is in, or just the sheer scale that that data is starting to aggregate in. So here we've specified uh, our data source. Uh, this is going to be the S3 bucket where our logs are going to be rotated to. Uh, you can see that we don't have to specify the full uh, file name. Uh, AWS Data Pipeline is smart enough to have uh, this, uh, these, uh, these placeholders uh, where you can start to uh, just uh, regular expression in uh, your actual file names. It's smart enough to know which ones to pull up. We're going to go ahead and replicate these logs uh, on a schedule. Simone is going to create the new schedule here. And we're going to do a, a daily report against these logs. So we're going to pull these logs down. They're coming off the app servers. They're going into S3. And we're going to process those with Amazon Elastic MapReduce. Again, designed for data. So it doesn't matter how large these logs get or how large our application is or how many customers that we have. We can start to pull down and start to get some insight into how our applications are building out, uh, how our uh, customers are using our applications. So we're going to go ahead and configure a new Hadoop cluster. Uh, this cluster is going to be deployed automatically by AWS Data Pipeline. It'll run against the logs and then terminate. So you'll stop paying for it because we have pay-as-you-go um, uh, pricing. The step is just the Java class, uh, which is going to run the analytics. We also need to provide the input. We're going to give that the logs. And you can see the UI starts to show that there is a, a pipeline forming from our logs through to our automated, orchestrated Hadoop environment. Now we need somewhere for those reports to go. So we're going to create a new data node. This is the, sort, the, the final destination of our daily reports. Uh, so the uh, logs are going to come from the app servers. They're going to go into Hadoop. They're going to get processed. We're going to run our business logic again there. We're going to get some insight about how customers are running on our application. Then we're going to drop those reports uh, into a final bucket. Again, we can use our templating language here so we don't have to specify the exact file name. Okay. So now we can also add a, um, uh, some additional configuration options into our, uh, into our Hadoop cluster. Uh, we can say uh, what types of uh, uh, cluster instances we want to use. We can say what type of uh, um, uh, how many instances we want there to run on that cluster. And a data pipeline will go off and provision everything that we need uh, to go ahead and do that. Now, the final activity that I want to show you is uh, something that al along the lines of scheduling, which allows us to use preconditions to do a weekly roll-up of these daily reports. So these reports are going to get published daily on a schedule. And we want to roll those reports up each and every, at the end of each and every week. Uh, to be able to review them maybe for our Monday morning meeting. So what we can do here is we can set preconditions. We won't have this step of the pipeline uh, execute until we have seven days' worth of logs to actually start looking at. 
Again, we can either run this in an uh, Elastic MapReduce uh, environment with Hadoop, or we can simply specify our own code uh, to be able to run against that. Here we're just specifying a bash script uh, which lives in S3. We're going to schedule this to run uh, once a week. Uh, we schedule it. We connect up the uh, reports on the weekly schedule, uh, click on Activate, and we're basically uh, done. So here Simone is finally co connecting up the input, which is going to be those daily logs, and then the output, which is going to be the weekly log, we're just going to send back to that same bucket. And that's pretty much it. Point and click uh, creation of complex, lightweight environments to enable your data analytics from your log files. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. That's cool, right? Eh? Um, you guys have any use for this? Anybody? Yeah. So this kind of lets me to, to wrap up. Yeah, uh, I hope that I've given you today uh, a little bit of a glimpse of, of uh, sort of the observations that I had of what our companies that are building 21st century architectures, really cloud native uh, applications, how they've been building them, and what sort of the, uh, the core abstractions are where they live on. Uh, remember, you need to be able to control your architecture from your business perspective. You need to be resilient, adaptive, and data-driven. Now, I actually want to go back to each four of those and, uh, and pick my favorite in each of those. Now, for me, in the world of controllable, it is extremely important to get your head around that cost is cert certainly a first primary object in your thinking, in your architecture. We now have given you all these tools, also with tagging and all the other things that you can do to really architect with cost in mind, so that you can actually support your business from a cost perspective. In adaptive, I think it is really important from the beginning to make as li little assumptions as possible, if possibly even make no assumptions. If you make no assumptions, you cannot make any mistakes there either. And you can build your architectures really the way that you want to build your architectures and use late binding to actually really assign them to the resources that you think are the best at that moment. In terms of resilience, I think it's important that you really think about failures. Uh, because failures are going to happen. And it's not necessarily Amazon-induced failures. Your own code will be full of failures as well. And they may be triggered by conditions that you didn't know even existed. Uh, and so make sure that you have as little code paths as possible, that you keep your code as simple as possible by not treating failure as an exception. And then the last one is just a pure practical advice and it is put everything in logs. And now that you have the AWS data pipeline, it makes it really easy for you to move those logs to places where you want them and to do the analytics on them that you've always wanted to, to do. With that, you know, there's one key thing behind all of this. And this is actually the one that made me put on that first slide in 2007, the world being the foundation for 21st century architectures. Everything that was a constrained resource is now a programmable resource. You have at your fingertips the world's largest capacity, unlimited capacity, unlimited storage, resilient, fault tolerant. You can build your business anywhere in the world from your laptop or from your desktop. With that, there's actually one last commandment left. Yeah? Thou shalt turn off the lights. And with that, I mean that if you are actually running a dev test cluster, yeah? in the past, with real resources, you would just leave that darn thing running. But now, today, you're actually allowed to turn them off when you go home. Yeah, there's a great story from, uh, from Simple Geo. Um, company that also run compete on AWS, and they felt that their, their cost in AWS was rising much more than that they actually were getting API calls and things like that. So what they did was they actually put the daily, hourly, daily, and weekly AWS run rate on a big dashboard that they had in the middle of their office. 
And suddenly, every engineer that fired up a test cluster could see the dollars going up. And even more important, they were all so proud when they went home that night and turned off the, de the desk, desk cluster and they saw the dollars going down. So with that, turn off the lights if you can. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's first keynote session. Please join us for our next keynote program at 1.30 p.m. Ladies and gentlemen, the session will begin upstairs at 10.30. Thank you. Excuse me, 10.40.